Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and ever living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that when we obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Joel. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To me be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord.
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. In the name of the living God, who is creating, redeeming, and sustaining us. Well, good morning, good morning. You know, I love today's gospel, and every time I think about it, and about the spiritual danger of comparing ourselves to others, I remember a story my great-grandfather used to tell. It's a story about two brothers who, like my great-grandfather, came over from Ireland, from the old country. And the Flanagan brothers, well, they weren't very nice men. In fact, they were terrible men. Although they were filthy rich, they were very stingy. They were terrible drunkards, and they beat their wives and children. And even the neighborhood dogs were afraid of the Flanagan brothers. Well, one day, Tommy Flanagan died, and his brother Michael went to the parish priest, and Michael proposed a terrible bargain to the priest. He said, Father, I know my brother wasn't a good man, but I want people to think well of him, and I will give a million dollars to the church orphanage if you will tell people he was a saint at his funeral. But you must use those exact words, Father. You must tell them that Tommy was a saint. Well, this caused a terrible crisis of conscience for the priest. He knew the orphanage was deeply in debt, and the children of the parish had a terrible need for that money. But he couldn't imagine lying about Tommy Flanagan and losing all moral authority in the parish. Well, the day of the funeral came and the priest rose to the pulpit to give the homily. He said, I knew Tommy Flanagan. I knew him all my life. I knew him well. He was a drunkard and a cruel man. He beat his children and his wife, and he never came to Mass. He was stingy and a bully and a lout. But, the priest said, compared to his brother Michael, Tommy Flanagan was a saint. Like I said, I love this gospel because we find at least three aspects in this passage that are classic Luke. The first of these is the way Luke uses pairs to tell a story. Not long ago, we heard the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Last week, we heard the story of the widow and the unjust judge. Luke begins the story this week two men went up to the temple to pray. The opening echoes with another line, another story from Luke. A certain man had two sons. And just like the story of the prodigal son, when we hear that these two men went up to the temple to pray, we suspect there's going to be some trouble. Another aspect of this story that is classic Luke is the notion of inclusion. Luke's gospel is the gospel of radical inclusion. In Jesus' time, it was clear that there was a circle of holiness. And some people were in the circle, and some people were outside the circle, including women, lepers, those who were sick, and especially tax collectors. Tax collectors were particularly despised because they did not simply collect the amount of tax that was owed. Because the position was unpaid, they had to collect more than the tax was owed to support themselves. And they often used violence and extortion to collect the taxes. And most importantly, they were seen as collaborators working with the occupying Roman government to suppress the people of Israel. Tax collectors were dreaded and they were despised. But in Luke's gospel, everybody gets invited into the circle of holiness. And that includes tax collectors. Jesus eats with them. He even calls them friends. 
Now, the third aspect of this story that marks it as fitting squarely into Luke's gospel is the way it upends our expectation. Luke does that constantly. Jesus does that constantly. This story is sort of like one of those mirrors at the circus where our reflections are distorted. They're still recognizable. They're not at all what we expect. And we've already talked about one of these. Jesus upends our expectations in that the tax collector isn't the villain of the story. A second place that expectation is frustrated is where this story occurs, the temple. For the most part, for most good devout Jews in the first century Palestine, the temple was the holiest place on earth. It served as the fulcrum of the world, the place where heaven and earth intersect. But I suspect if you ask Jesus how he felt about the temple, his feelings would be richly and profoundly ambivalent. While he knew of its scriptural importance, he also knew the ways in which the temple system had been compromised and corrupted. So the temple was traditionally a place where sacrifice was offered, yes, it's a place of prayer, but one could pray most anywhere. The temple system was built on sacrifice and a transactional approach to washing away one's sins or having one's prayers answered. In Jesus' story, however, rather than a place of sacrifice, the temple becomes a place of mercy. And rather than a system of merit, Mercy seems to rain down on some shockingly undeserving people. And then Jesus capsizes our expectation about the Pharisee. He's a fine specimen of a faithful churchgoer. We get the feeling he prays often. He fasts regularly. He gives money to the church. Honestly? That's a good, solid spiritual regimen. He'd probably fit in well over at St. Elsewhere Episcopalus Church. He might even fit in well here with us. I suspect he was really a good guy, a decent sort, and a fine churchman. But he was blind to two critical issues. The source of his blessing and the purpose of his blessing. He cannot see that the source of his blessing was not his own good character, and he cannot understand that all of his blessings were to be used for God's purposes. Luke offers us this sharp contrast. The tax collector's focus is inward on his own sins and his failure to lead a holy life. The Pharisee's focus is outward on other people and how they live. We so often attempt to summarize our brothers and sisters in one glance, as this Pharisee does. And therein we find ourselves mired in spiritual quicksand, the sin of dismissal. It points us to one of the greatest risks in our spiritual lives, comparing ourselves to others. I want us to examine the ways we might compare ourselves to other people, the books we've read, what we do for a living, where we went to school, the car we drive, our exercise regime, who we vote for, the neighborhood we grew up in, or where we go to church. The Pharisee is convinced he is in good shape with the Almighty. His claim to righteousness is based upon his own accomplishments, while the taxpayer collector realizes his only chance is God's mercy. Without God's mercy, he hasn't got a prayer. 
In a classic upheaval of expectations, Jesus says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a close parallel to the idea that the first will be last and the last will be first. And then Jesus tells us that the tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified. That word justified in the Greek carries a lot of connotations, including the connotation of having gone through a trial or a judicial proceeding. It means having been acquitted, restored, forgiven, made right, or rebalanced. Here we find another inversion of what we expect because the Pharisee offers a number of justifications for his life and his goodness. The tax collector offers no defense. He can rely on nothing other than God's mercy. In one sense, learning to live without a self-justification is a terrible risk. It leaves us vulnerable to the judgment of others and even our harshest critic, ourselves. In another sense, it's very liberating because we come to realize that our justification or our salvation doesn't depend on our merit, but rather God's mercy. And one of the things we can let go of, one of the things we must let go of is keeping score. We don't need to keep score against our brothers or sisters or against God anymore. It's a hard lesson, my friends. But this parable teaches us that in the spiritual life, if you're keeping score, you've already lost the game. Amen. I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Standing or kneeling, let us offer our prayers to God for peace and a time of healing. For the Diocese of West Texas and our standing, and nominating committees as they discern the slate for our next bishop, for David and Rayford, our bishops, for our clergy, for this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place. Lord, hear us. us. For mercy, justice, and peace among all peoples, Lord, hear us. 
for the President of the United States, for the Congress, and for our court systems, that a spirit of compassion and the wisdom of discernment might guide their leadership. Lord, hear us. For our city, those who live in it, and for our families, friends, and companions. Lord, hear us. For all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, travelers and strangers, and all with heavy burdens. Lord, hear us. For those who have asked for our prayers, especially Rosalind Alterman, Susan Beardsley, Kimberly Harrison Boldrick, Thelma Duffy, Gordon Dunkley, Charles Field, Andrew Groy, Beverly Purcell Guerra, Gloria Guzman, Vicki Hatt, Jenny Halder, Patricia Onier, Mel Jackson, Patricia Johnson, Arlen Leader, Sherry Lockman, Nikki Marriott, Megan Menares, Jim Pearson, Clyde Phelps, Paul Pineda, Kathy Robinson, Sarah, David Solis, the Order of Ursuline Sisters in Ukraine, Molly Zachary. And for those with long-term concerns, Ainsley Baird Brown, Joseph Brumlick, Janice Delara, Tyler Fockery, Tim Finan, Karim Foda, Alice Haney, Anna James, Anna Jane Hayes, Kev, Carolyn Klebaum, Nicole N McNeil, J.D. Monk, Ruth Payton, Patsy Warnicke, Kathleen Seal Withers, Sharon Cottonwood. Lord, hear us. For all the departed who rest in Christ, especially Norb Cole, Delicia Comte, Betsy Simpson. Lord, hear us. God of unconditional love, hear the prayers we offer this day, <clears throat> defend us from every evil, and bring us to your heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, <clears throat> by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning and welcome to all of you. We are so glad you are here in worship with us, whether you're joining us online or in person. Please know of our warm welcome for you. If you're visiting, take a moment, fill out a visitor card so we can be in touch with you about ways to get connected in our community. 
I want to start off with a big thank you for everybody who participated in our Come and See weekend last weekend. It was great. We had a wonderful, joy-filled day on Saturday with a barbecue and then ha continued the celebrations all through the day Sunday. It was really wonderful to celebrate the rededication of our spaces and the beginning of a new chapter for this community. So thanks for all of you who came and saw. It was wonderful. Um, we started some new uh, formation classes today. There's one uh, that I'm teaching called Just Because It's Simple Doesn't Mean It's Easy. Uh, all of our forma the formation classes in that room are uh, recorded, so you're welcome to go and watch them afterwards. And Anne is leading a newcomer gathering in series um, beginning this Sunday also. So if you're newer to the parish and want to find out more, please join us in the Dean Richardson room for the next few weeks and learn more about St. Mark's and the Episcopal Church. This is the big Halloween week for St. Mark's. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance to put in your clergy costume request. We have already purchased our costumes. <clears throat> so now if you want to know what our theme is this year, you're going to have to show up on Wednesday. From 5 to 7, we'll be having dinner. We'll be blessing costumes. We'll be having a trunk or treat in the parking lot. It's going to be great fun. Um, because it's all hands on deck for that, we will not actually have our midweek Eucharist or Bible study that night, but do come and join the festivities. It promises to be great fun. Then, coming up this coming Friday at 7 p.m., we have a new event, which sounds so fun to me. You are welcome to wear costumes. You are not required. But we will be showing um, at 7 p.m. on Friday, October 28th, the 1925 silent film, The Phantom of the Opera. While the film is playing, we have a wonderful organist that we've brought in who improvises uh, the soundtrack throughout the whole thing. So we hope you will join us to hear renowned organist Dorothy Papadakis and just have a different experience of um, Phantom of the Opera. Invite your friends, your neighbors, it should be a lot of fun. We have a number of events coming up on the calendar, including All Saints in our parish meeting. Um, please look in the, uh, in the bulletin for those things that are coming. We're also continuing to collect money as special offerings for Hurricane Fiona and Ian. It is stewardship season, so I'm happy to invite up David Harris, who is a member of our vestry, who's going to uh, give us a little invitation related to that today. Good morning. Early in my life, my parents taught me an age-old maxim. What you put into life is what you get out of it. The same can be true for work, school, civic groups, family, friends, as well as our church. St. Mark's Episcopal Church welcomes many people from diverse faith traditions and allows us to meet God through his people at 315 East Pecan, as well as in our ministries off campus. This is summarized in our church's vision statement. Feeding San Antonio with the bread of life, feeding the hungry with real food, feeding those who are hungry for knowledge and meaning, feeding those who are hungry for beauty and creativity. At the time I joined the church in 2016, I knew that I wanted to be involved in this church and I've been blessed with many opportunities from serving on the finance committee, the Crockett Academy service team, and now the vestry. I know that through sweat equity, as well as through annual giving, I receive more in return than what I have received. It is that time of year when we reflect on what we receive by associating ourselves with St. Mark's and request your support of the church and in, in its ongoing ministries, including its capital needs. For me, I pledge as a statement of faith, gratitude, hope, and love. I ask for you to come and see what Mark, St. Mark's means to you. Get involved in something new, and you, and you will see what I mean. I encourage your thoughtful and deliberate support of St. Mark's during this annual pledge season. Faithfully consider making a generous pledge, and join us on November 13 for a celebration of the gifts we share with our St. Mark's community. Thank you. Thank you, David. November 13th is also the day of our annual parish meeting at the 1010 hours, so we look forward to seeing you for that as well. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no, to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor every person as a beloved child of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.